As the food is emptied from the stomach, it goes into the small intestine. Let's take a closer look at the small intestine, which is divided up into three main parts. The first foot or so of the small intestine is called the duodenum. And then we have about eight feet of jejunum, the middle part of the small intestine. And the final 12 feet of the small intestine are the ileum. So between the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, we have about 20 feet of small intestine. So not so small. It's not the length that makes this the small intestine. It's the narrower diameter. The long tube of the small intestine is coiled up to fit into the abdominal cavity and it's held in place by the mesentery or the sheet of connective tissue. It's also got some fat in there. And this mesentery or the sheet of connective tissue helps to keep the intestine from getting tangled and it also contains the blood vessels and the lymphatic vessels that are serving the small intestine. In order for the small intestine to do its job, the job of chemical digestion and absorption, lots and lots of absorption, we need to have a lot of surface area. So there are four things about the small intestine that help to increase its surface area so we have more surface for the absorption of nutrients. The first thing is that it's a very long tube. It's like 20 feet long. The second thing is along this long tube in the mucosa, we have mucosal folds. These are like circular folds of the mucosa along the inside of the small intestine. And these help to increase the surface area more, sort of like having a um, corrugated tube instead of a smooth one. Those ridges give you more surface area. In addition to the mucosal folds, we also have structures on the inside of the small intestine that are called villi. These are finger-like projections of the mucosa, as though we had a nice flat sheet of mucosa and then you stuck your fingers up through it, so now you've got a number of little um, bumps. These help to increase the surface area a lot. We can see the villi when we look at the small intestine um, in this drawing, and we can also see the villi when we look at the mucosa under the microscope. Each villus is covered in the epithelium of the mucosa. In this case, it's a layer of simple columnar epithelium. So each villus, each finger-like projection, has cells all along it. Each cell around the villus has another mechanism to increase the surface area of that particular cell. And that is that each cell has microvilli. Microvilli are tiny, tiny folds in the apical membrane of the epithelial cells that give you a whole lot more membrane per individual cell. So we have a long tube with circular folds with these finger-like villi poking into the inside of the small intestine and each cell along each villus has tiny little folds in the membrane, the microvilli, to increase the surface area even more. All of these things together give us an incredible amount of surface area for absorption in the small intestine. As we saw with the stomach, which had two main types of motility or two types of movement, the small intestine also has two main types of movement. The first type of movement is called segmentation. In segmentation, circular muscle and little sections of the small intestine squeeze so that we're constricting a little area of the small intestine and then relaxing it, constricting another little area and then relaxing, constricting another and relaxing. This is segmentation. And these little constrictions or contractions are important to mix the contents of the small intestine. So we're mixing the chyme from the stomach with all of the uh, secretions coming into the small intestine. And we're also getting good contact between the mucosa of the small intestine and the food in the lumen of the small intestine. Segmentation allows a lot of absorption to take place and it helps move the contents of the small intestine along a little bit, but it's not really good at helping move things along. Segmentation continues until most of the nutrients have been absorbed from the small intestine. When most of the nutrients are gone, then the small intestine switches from segmentation to waves of smooth muscle contraction or peristalsis. So we have waves of contraction that help push the, uh, the chyme, the food mixture along the small intestine from the stomach further and further towards the large intestine. 
These waves of peristalsis are what push the food along until it gets to the point where the ileum, the last section of the small intestine, meets the cecum, the first part of the large intestine. The small intestine and the large intestine are separated by the ileocecal valve. This valve is usually closed. The waves of peristalsis push the food along and exert enough pressure to push the remains of the food through the ileocecal valve into the cecum. Something that's interesting about this and connects what's going on in the stomach to what's going on other places in the digestive system is when you eat a meal and you have food in your stomach, that causes the release of gastrin. Gastrin increases your stomach movement and it increases secretion into the stomach so your stomach can digest the food coming in. At the same time, gastrin, which remembers a hormone so it's all over in the body, gastrin relaxes the ileocecal valve. What that does is it makes it easier to push food out of the small intestine to help empty the small intestine to be ready to receive the new meal that you're consuming. So when a meal comes into your stomach, it actually has mechanisms that help move the previous meal out of the small intestine so there's more room for the new one. The remains of the food, which is mostly waste, gets pushed from the ileum into the large intestine. The mucosa along the large intestine is the same as we saw in the small intestine and in the stomach. It is simple columnar epithelium. This is important for being able to absorb any remaining nutrients as well as water out of the large intestine. And there are also a lot of cells producing mucus. A lot of mucus is produced in the large intestine. And this mucus is important because it helps to form the food waste together into lumps that we call feces. And it helps to lubricate that feces so that it comes out easier during defecation. When it comes to moving the food waste along through the large intestine, there are three types of motility involved. The first type of motility is segmentation, similar to what we saw with the small intestine, where parts of the large intestine will constrict and relax, and another part will constrict and relax. The segmentation in the large intestine is happening much more slowly than the segmentation in the small intestine. As we saw with the small intestine, segmentation is important for mixing the contents and for allowing good contact for absorption. As we um, are absorbing what we need to out of the small intestine, then we switch to what are called mass movements. Mass movements are more of a sort of peristalsis, a wave of contraction that's going to help move the contents along the large intestine. The final type of movement that we see involving the large intestine is defecation. And this is the actual elimination of the waste through the anus. Defecation requires coordination of a couple of things. First, we have to have peristalsis or wave of muscle contraction coming down the descending colon along the sigmoid colon and down the rectum. So we get that peristalsis of the large intestine and the rectum. And along with that, we have to have relaxation of the anal sphincters. There are two anal sphincters associated with the rectum. The first one is the internal anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is made of smooth muscle, which means we do not have voluntary control over that. It's going to open or close based on other signals that don't have anything to do with our conscious choice. The other anal sphincter is the external anal sphincter, which thankfully is made of skeletal muscle, which we have conscious control over. So we can make a conscious decision when to open and when to close the external anal sphincter. Let's take a look at the steps involved in regulation of defecation. Defecation is triggered by the presence of feces in the rectum. When mass movements push feces down into the rectum, that stretches the rectum and activates receptors. There are stretch receptors in the rectum. Activation of these stretch receptors causes three important things to happen. First, it causes relaxation of the internal anal sphincter the one that we don't have control over. Second, it stimulates peristalsis of the descending and sigmoid colons as well as the rectum. So we're pushing feces down further and we've opened the internal anal sphincter. 
The third thing that happens that's caused by activating the stretch receptors is that a signal goes up to the brain and it causes the urge to defecate. You feel like you need to go to the bathroom. At that point, after those three things have happened due to stretch receptors, we have a choice to make. You can either hold it or you can go. If it's a good time to go to the bathroom, then we go to the bathroom and we make a conscious decision to relax the external anal sphincter. When we combine the relaxed external anal sphincter with the peristalsis of the colon and the relaxation of the internal anal sphincter, the feces is pushed out. We can aid defecation by using the Valsalva maneuver. If you remember that from the respiratory system, you take and hold a breath, that puts pressure on the abdominal organs, that's gonna help push feces down into the rectum that will stretch the rectum and result in an increase in the peristalsis, relaxation of the internal anal sphincter, and we've made the conscious decision to relax the external anal sphincter, so defecation occurs. If it's not a good time to go to the bathroom, then we make the conscious decision to keep the external anal sphincter closed. Then the feces can't come out. After a few moments like that, the stretch receptors will stop signaling. So as soon as feces came into the rectum, the stretch receptors started signaling, which included the urge to go to the bathroom. Once we've held the external anal sphincter closed for a little while, those stretch receptors stop signaling. That only lasts for a little while. It only lasts until feces is pushed a little further into the rectum, at which point we activate the stretch receptors again and cause peristalsis of the colon and rectum, relax the internal anal sphincter, and we feel a stronger urge to go than we felt before.